Hello, I'm Captain Dr. Dave. I want to welcome you to this uh, presentation of Cruising with Pets. This is the first in a three-part series uh, concerning uh, pets aboard cruising vessels, mostly geared toward people who are going to be cruising relatively long-term or offshore. Uh, this, pr this particular uh, series was in the past offered through Seven Seas U, the educational arm of the Seven Seas Cruising Association, the SSCA, but recently there have been some issues with Seven Seas U, and I want to continue to get this out there, so I've decided to make it available through my website, www.captaindrdave.com. Um, my website address will be appearing periodically in the lower corner of the screen throughout this presentation. Yet, uh, is not necessary for you to have any particular uh, ish, uh, reference sources through for this course or for these classes or this webinar if you want to call it that. Uh, I do have a few books that I have made available that I've written myself. Uh, it is not necessary that you buy them and most people aren't going to need them but I have on screen here the available the uh, sources for those. You can get them through my website, which takes you to createspace.com, which is the publisher. It's a branch of Amazon, so if you have an Amazon account, you'll be able to order the, any of these books directly through CreateSpace and use your Amazon information. I've provided discount codes uh, for $9 discount on where there is no pet doctor. Um, I've got uh, a discount code for uh, the the videos, Veterinary Care for Your Dog and Veterinary Care for Your Cat, also subtitled Where There Is No Pet Doctor. Those are a video uh, supplement to the, to the book for those who are interested in seeing how things are actually seeing how things are done rather than just reading about them. In addition, I have a book for those of you who do not have yet have your pet uh, adjusted or adapted to living aboard a boat. There might be some, you might find some very interesting information in my Pets on Board book. Uh, that is available at a 20% discount through my website only using the discount code that I have listed here. Uh, none of these, again, none of these are required, and it is not necessary for you to purchase anything in order to take this this uh, series of classes. Uh, the first thing that you need to understand when you're going to go cruising is that it's really not much different out there than it is at home. There is uh, very little difference once your pet is adjusted to living aboard your boat, regardless of the size of your boat. Um, there's not much difference between that and living at home. As far as your pet is concerned, it is home. Okay, You need to be prepared for as many things as you possibly can. Obviously, you cannot prepare for everything. So you want to do, uh, you know, figure out how much you want to, how involved you want to get in your preparations. You need to have a rough idea of where you are going. Prepare for the most rigid requirements that you might need to encounter. In other words, if you're going to be traveling uh, to different islands, such as down through the Caribbean, you're going to need some information as to what is required to, to get your pet ashore on those islands, and we'll deal to some extent with those requirements. Take along adequate supplies. Obviously, what you take is going to depend on how long you're going to be gone, uh, it's going to be it also depend to some extent upon your particular skill set. If you are a, a doctor or a nurse or a uh, health practitioner of some sort, you may want to prepare for a little in a little greater depth than someone who, who is an accountant or a lawyer. Um, and, and I have information here that uh, will allow you to share your own medical kit when it's appropriate under certain circumstances. So you don't necessarily have to have a veterinary kit along just for your pets. This is a picture of our boat. Uh, we lived aboard a 37-foot CSY cruising vessel. Uh, during our four years of being gone, we sailed down through the Bahamas uh, to the Dominican Republic and then across to Puerto Rico and on across the uh, Anagata Passage to St. Martin and on down into the Antilles, the, uh, the Leeward Islands. Uh, during that four-year period that we lived aboard the boat in the, in the Caribbean, um, we spent a year in Luperon in the Dominican Republic 
a hold up during the year of 2005 for hurricane season, which was a pretty severe and protracted hurricane season. This is a, a picture of our boat as we were leaving Luperon in the DR. Um, here we will. We're going to cover a few things in in particular. We're going to talk about some medical supplies to carry. This is more or less going to be a minimum uh, suggested uh, kit that you that will be helpful to you under under relatively simple circumstances. We're going to talk some about general entrance requirements and how to prepare for those for getting into various islands that you might uh, encounter or beyond that. Uh, we're going to talk about identification of your pet in the event that it should get lost. How do you get it back? Uh, we're going to talk about some local and regional dangers that you may encounter depending on where you are cruising. It might be the Caribbean, it might be the Great Lakes. Uh, we're going to deal with some minor, uh, common minor health problems. We're going to talk about feeding your pet. A lot of people don't give any thought to this before they leave at all, but it's something you should seriously uh, consider. We're going to talk about pet safety aboard, and we're going to talk a little bit about some pet behavioral issues. And for the most part in this discussion, we're going to, our, our talk will be limited to dogs and cats only. First of all, before you go, if your pet's not neutered, get it done, male or female, okay? It's a, it's a significant uh, savings in headaches and hassles for you and your pet. Uh, we eliminate, when we have an animal neutered, we eliminate an entire organ system, and it happens to be an organ system that is very susceptible to pathology. Uh, uterine uh, pathologies, ovarian uh, issues, testicular and prostate issues, mammary cancer, all of those things are tied into the hormones produced by the, by the reproductive system, and when you can eliminate that system in a very healthy fashion, uh, you may end up saving your pet's life in the long run. If you know, if your pet's not breeding, there's no particular reason to not have it neutered, and uh, it's one of those things that I strongly urge people to do. You know, the whole one of the principal things we're going to deal with through this entire series is is preventative issues, and this is one of those major preventative things that you can do. If you have a male, get off the macho kick. Don't be all upset about the fact that he's going to lose his gonads. It's not a major issue to him. It's only a major issue to you if it, if it seems to bother you. Have it done now while it can be done safely and easily because it's much safer and easier to do now than it will be down there. Get it done well before you leave so that they can fully recover before it's time to head out. We're going to talk some here about medical supplies to have aboard, and again, it depends on the length of your cruise and the location of your cruise and your own particular skill level. As a minimum, you should take along medications that your pet uses on a regular basis. If you have a pet that has some arthritis problems and is taking some of the designer drug type of anti-inflammatories, Duramax, Remedil, Medicam, and so forth, you probably should take some of those along. You may have some issues down island as far as not necessarily finding uh, these the anti-inflammatory drugs, but maybe in finding the specific one that your particular pet takes. Um, allergy medications. If your pet has allergy issues and takes uh, antihistamines and, or corticosteroids, take some of those along and a convulsant medication or insulin. Now I always have recommended and still firmly adhere to this recommendation that if you have an epileptic pet that has significant issues with seizures or if you have a diabetic, your pet is really not a good candidate for travel for more than 24 hours or 48 hours maximum away from good veterinary care. Therefore, those particular uh, pets are not really good candidates for long-term cruising. If you get caught in, an, in a situation where you get into a, a, a major status epilepticus uh, situation or a diabetic crisis of some sort, you're probably going to end up with a dead pet before you are able to resolve the issue in, in most situations and circumstances where you're out cruising and are any particular distance away from good veterinary care. So, you know, think about your pet, and if, you know, if you have to leave him home in order to go, then leave him in the care of someone who has uh, full 
authorization to do whatever is necessary when at home because chances are you're going to do better in that situation than taking them with you. You may or may not need motion sickness medications. Most pets do fine once they've adjusted to being at sea and most have very little in the way of motion sickness problems. Vitamins and other medications, if you know, if you want to take them, take them, but you're probably going to have a hard time keeping up with your routine once you run out of the supply that you take with you. So you may want to think about just discontinuing that sort of uh, product. Heartworm preventative is probably the single most important thing that you should take because you are in uh, the tropics. You are in, uh, in heartworm country, so to speak. And uh, cats and dogs both should be on, a, on a, an effective heartworm preventative. Flea and tick control products are the other thing that are probably uh, very significant. And uh, you should give some serious thought to what you're going to do for th flea and tick control. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. If you want to take it to the next step, um, some antibiotics to carry along in case you run into anything. Probably a good 14-day uh, supply of amoxicillin. It's cheap. It's, fair, it's quite effective as an antibiotic. It's easy to get. Probably, you know, is adequate for you to take along. If you want to take that sort of thing, you can use tablets or capsules, or you can get a, a, a liquid version of it. Uh, you can get it from your veterinarian, have them write you a prescription for it to take along. Um, it's your choice. I don't really recommend anything more than that because remember the, the big deal is that with, with antibiotics is that you, you're planning on never using them. You're planning on these medications expiring before you ever have the opportunity to use them up and you're going to throw them away. So I generally don't advise that you take things like Batril or Orbex in a, you know, for a 75 pound dog or a 50 pound dog say um, a 14 day supply of Batril is going to cost you $100 or more and you're talking here about a product that you want to eventually throw away and replace with a new supply. Amoxicillin for that same time period you may be talking about $10 worth. So, uh, you know, in a, in a pinch, your, your pet can share your own antibiotics if necessary uh, if you're going to take antibiotics along for your own use. If you're going to share those antibiotics, you should have a reference source that will allow you to do this. And uh, I have a, a recommendation. Obviously, the book on the right, which is written by David W. Levine, uh, is my book of choice. It contains a drug formulary with most common uh, medications that humans might take uh, listed in the back um, <clears throat> that uh, in appropriate doses for dogs and cats. Uh, it should you need to use them in a pinch. It also includes a lot of information on very common problems that you might encounter. It does not get into the exotic such as cancers and uh, some of the exotic diseases that you might run into. Uh, but on the other hand, those are situations, you know, my general recommendation is when, you're, when you can get to a veterinarian, if you have a sick pet, a veterinarian is going, the worst veterinarian you encounter is probably going to do a lot better than the most knowledgeable lay person in, in dealing with and diagnosing and treating these kinds of diseases. So I do not get into the exotic. On the other hand, the, this other book listed here, Dog Owner's Home Veterinary Handbook, is a very good book. It's sold a lot of copies out there. It's, it's a very large tome and a very economically priced run. However, it has it contains an awful lot of information on diseases that I've never seen and that you probably never will either. Uh, it's really uh, more of a reference source for curiosity than it is for useful work. And uh, but if you want to carry that along with you, also that's you know it's probably one of the better books on the market. Certainly one of the more popular ones. My book happens to be a very niche. Uh, re uh, related uh, book and tends to be very specialized for the needs of those who are in doing backcountry activities such as cruising and RVing and backcountry travel. Uh, so some of the other things that you may want to consider here um, let's uh, talk about some topical antibiotic. Uh, you can carry some Neosporin. It's certainly useful. You can you carry it in your own medical kit. You don't have to carry it specifically in your pet's kit. Uh, preferably you want something that has no steroid in it, such as Neosporin. 
if your pet uses something on a regular basis, such as for an ear problem or whatever, something along the lines of Otamax or Panalog or Animax, there's a lot of uh, products on the market of this sort, combination products. Certainly want to bring along a little bit of that to get you along the way. Uh, and again, your pet can share your antibiotics under most circumstances if you need to. Quick Clot is a uh, brand name product that I think is a very handy product to have in your medical kit in the event of some sort of catastrophic incident where you have severe bleeding quick clot has the ability to, uh, to to arrest serious bleeding issues with some pressure you just open it is a uh, gauze packet that is in, impregnated with uh, clotting material that allows you to open, tear open the aluminum foil packet, pull out the dressing that's in there and hold it in place with pressure on a bleed, an actively bleeding uh, wound uh, for say five minutes and generally can have a very life-saving effect, uh, something for you to be aware of. Again, you can carry this in your human medical kit, and if you need it for your pet, it's perfectly safe to use it on your pet. Uh, there's Quick Clot, there's Pet Clot. It really doesn't matter which one you carry. They all essentially work the same way. Um, you know, Share the one that's in your human kit, or put, buy a Quick Clot, uh, general purpose Quick Clot, and put it in your pet kit, and if you need it, you can borrow it from there. Another thing that I recommend is a tick scoop. It is a little little plastic device, usually, that's got a little forked end on it. Sometimes it looks like a plastic spoon with a little notch carved in the end of it. Uh, there are a variety of types. It's one of the best things I know for removing ticks. Very safe, very easy. Gets the whole tick out. Doesn't leave the head behind. Um, and... Uh, it's, an, it's a ridiculously expensive little device for what it is, but it's something that's uh, hard to replace. Otherwise, you're left with using the burnt match or uh, some other uh, old-fashioned trick that, that sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. Uh, aspirin. I always like people to understand, even though that veterinarians nowadays tend to give aspirin a pretty bad name, it is still probably one of the safest drugs on the market for general purpose use. Other than the occasional, other than the occasional uh, situation where a pet gets some upset stomach from aspirin, most of the time it's not a problem. Okay, generally pets do not have any serious issues as a result of it, as opposed to some of the newfangled um, designer anti-inflammatories that are on the market, where sometimes, in under rare circumstances, a a pet will have a severe uh, untoward reaction to the product and can actually die from the effects. Uh, aspirin tends to be relatively safe. Uh, you know, any kind of reaction to any of these drugs is rare, but uh, aspirin, in my opinion, tends to be much safer than veterinarians give credit for. Uh, until about 15 or 20 years ago, we used to use aspirin routinely in dogs. Never, very seldom had any issues with it other than the occasional vomiting incident. Um, but you need, again, you need to use it at a safe and proper dosage. Uh, use it only as needed for pain, fever, and inflammation. Uh, you need to know the safe dosage. It is safe to use in cats as long as you use it at a proper dose. And that dose revolves around doing it once ever, no more often than once every three days. And that in, in that situation, I would give, for an average 10-pound cat, I would give about a quarter of a human grown-up aspirin dose, a quarter of a 325 milligram, a quarter of a five-grain aspirin tablet once every three days. Usually in a cat, I tell people, give a quarter of a tablet once. And if you need to give it, if you feel you need to give it again three days later, then something more major may be going on, and you probably should get that cat checked out. Do not give any other kind of human anti-inflammatories. They tend to be da dangerous. Do not give Advil, okay, ibuprofen. Do not give um, any Motrin. Do not give um, any kind of aspirin substitute. Tylenol is not safe in cats. Tylenol can kill your cat. Uh, so, you know, avoid any product that is not pure aspirin. And do not give your pet 
any kind of anti-inflammatory if your pet is taking steroids. Okay, if your pet is taking any kind of a steroid medication, do not give Rimadyl, do not give Duramax, do not give aspirin, do not give any of those products. Um, motion sickness medication, again, seldom a problem in pets. You can share your own if you want to with your pet or if you feel you need to. You can give a dose of meclizine to a to a dog you can give on in general 10 to 25 milligrams uh, 10 milligrams to a small dog 25 milligrams to a large dog for motion sickness but you shouldn't really need to I generally recommend eye irrigation solution be carried along in your pack because there is never uh, an, any kind of an issue with an eye always has the potential to be a serious situation so always care carry a bottle of eye irrigation solution the brand name that I'm I generally toss around is Dacrios but there are a variety of generics on the market that are much cheaper uh, do not use Visine type uh, products in the eye do not use anything that's designed to get the red out because the red is the symptom of a that the eye is not healthy and we do not want to just simply cover it up swimmers ear solution should be uh, on board. I uh, generally recommend that you carry a commercial human swimmer's ear uh, solution. Um, you can make your own uh, using 90% uh, isopropyl alcohol. Okay, take about, get yourself a bottle of 90%. This is not rubbing alcohol. This is 90%. Sometimes it'll be 91, 93, 97% but uh, you do not want 70% alcohol. You, you pour mostly, and it is not a fixed ratio, pour, pour mostly uh, isopropyl alcohol into the bottle and then add two or three drops of glycerin to it, shake it up. And this will make an excellent ear drying solution for when your pet has been swimming and you wanna dry those ears up so that you don't end up with a, an ear infection. Uh, rubbing alcohol. Not really necessary that you carry it. You don't need it. Generally not a big issue. Betadine solution, on the other hand, is a what we call a tamed iodine. Povidone iodine solution is the generic term for it. P-O-V-I-D-O-N-E. Povidone iodine. It is a non-stinging, non, it is non uh, it is non, uh irritating uh, type of iodine solution designed for, uh, to, for use as an antiseptic for flushing wounds and so forth. You generally mix a small amount of betadine solution into a large volume of water so that the water is, uh, it needs to be clean, fresh water. It doesn't need to be sterile water. Uh, and the water should be, once you've added the iodine, should be about the color of strong tea. That makes an excellent disinfectant solution for any kind of topical use. You can flush a wound with it. You can soak a wound in it. It's just a very, very good product, a very inexpensive product to carry along. And a bottle of betadine concentrate uh, it will last a very long time because you only need a few drops to make a, a, use, a usable solution. Keep in mind that betadine comes in a soap or a surgical scrub. It also comes in a douche. It comes in an ointment. It comes in a variety of issues. This is plain old betadine solution that you want to pick up. Hydrogen peroxide is useful for cleaning wounds. It's an excellent product for cleaning blood out of fabric if you need to uh, bleach flat fabric and get uh, remove blood before it has a chance to turn into a stain. Uh, it is not a particularly great antiseptic. It's a decent cleaning agent uh, and it is excellent sometimes as an emetic to induce vomiting. Say your pet has uh, possibly ingested some kind of poison. You can give it orally uh, a dose of hydrogen peroxide to help induce vomiting and sometimes recover the poison. Uh, it is, some t it is definitely worth carrying aboard. Epsom salts are good uh, as a soak for sprains and swellings. I always recommend that you carry some Epsom salts along. Should not, if there are open wounds, any kind of serious open wounds, Epsom salts are not indicated in that situation. But if you have a swollen joint, something along those lines, um, fill a bowl of water, uh, uh, fill a bowl with warm water and add Epsom salts until, until it essentially till it precipitates out 
then soak the swollen area in the Epsom salts and it will help take down the swelling. Soak it for about 10-15 minutes two or three times a day for a couple of days and usually that will do an excellent job of taking down the swelling and the inflammation. Do remember that when you are done with the soak each time you need to rinse thoroughly with fresh water so that you don't leave any salt behind. Otherwise the area will get will stay moist and will not dry. And finally a couple of things, other things that I recommend you should have a squirt bottle okay the sort of squirt bottle that uh, sometimes bottled water comes in with a little squirt top on it or uh, any kind of a Boston round type bottle or a uh, an old uh, shampoo bottle something that has a hole in the top in a, in a pinch you can take a, a large uh, Ziploc bag and poke a hole in it with a, with a uh, needle and fill it with water and squeeze it to aim it at whatever you want to flush out but a squirt bottle is handy for cleaning wounds it's handy for flushing uh, a lot of things out it's handy for flushing out the mouth in the event of any kind of uh, toxic exposure toenail trimmers get the good quality type uh, the kind that I show here that has uh, that has it's almost like a pair of pruning shears the large one will work on everything from uh, Great Dane toenails down to cat toenails. The small one is good for anything from cat toenails up to a medium-sized dog. Get a good pair. Uh, they usually cost about $10, $15, but they are excellent for toenail trimming. And when your dog is living aboard a boat, um, the toenails are not going to wear like they normally would and they are going to cause they're going to wreak havoc with your teak decks or your fiberglass decks or whatever the case may be so you're going to need to maintain those toenails i generally recommend a rectal thermometer the electronic ones that you can buy at, at walmart or uh, walgreens or cvs whatever kind uh, the little electronic ones that have a flexible tip on them work quite well they're quite accurate and the batteries generally last a long time, but carry a couple of them just in case the battery goes bad or something goes bad on one of them. The normal body temperature for a cat or dog is somewhere between, say, 100 and 100.5 up to about 102 to 102.5. When you get up to 103.5, it's suspicious, very suspicious. When you hit 104, there's a fever. Okay, we've got, when you hit 104, we either have hyperthermia mild hyperthermia or we have a fever going on so you should consider uh, that to be a warning point you should carry some syringes okay just in just in general uh, sometimes they're useful for, for useful for flushing things sometimes they're useful for injections uh, magnifying glass and a pen light is always handy I generally suggest that you pair that you uh, for cutting up pills you can use a pill cutter but uh, a pill cutter will you know cut a pill in half and then you can turn it 90 degrees and cut it in half again and you'll have quarters but at that point the pill cutter is useless if you carry a pair carry a pair of diagonal cutters the kind that you use for cutting wire in your toolbox uh, and you can borrow the ones out of your toolbox if you have them um, you can take a, a, a aspirin tablet and cut it roughly into 10 pieces pretty easily uh, much more accurate, much more uh, accurately than you can with a pill cutter. So I generally suggest that you carry that sort of thing. That's one of the best things I know for cutting pills. Uh, super glue, if you want to use it for minor cuts, a lot of times groomers use this if they nick a dog, say when they're trimming the ears or whatever, and they nick along the border of the ear, they'll put a drop of super glue on it to stop the bleeding. Uh, if you want to get more elaborate than that and carry the surgical glue that they sell at the drugstore, you can do that, but super glue will do the job. For bleeding toenails, rather than getting involved with glue and that sort of thing, I generally suggest to people that you take the bar and rake it across the bar of soap, and that very often will do a much better job and it's certainly much easier of, uh, to stop the bleeding toenail. Now, with proper identification is probably one of the most significant things that you can do. If you don't have your pet properly identified and it gets away, you may very well end up like some friends of ours did who were down in the Berry Islands in the Bahamas and their cat disappeared off the boat and they never saw it again. They were there for two weeks looking for it and never saw it again. If it had proper identification on it, 
they might have gotten it back because it would very likely what probably happened in that situation is the cat got on somebody else's boat and hid and the boat shoved off and left port and by the time they realized the cat was on board they had no idea where it came from. <clears throat> if the cat had been wearing uh, visible tags or an embroidered collar these people may very well have gotten their cat back. So proper identification is of the utmost importance because it, make, it can make all the difference between an enjoyable trip and one that ends in tragedy. So on your tags, you should have, on your pet, you should have an embroidered collar with nothing more on. It doesn't need to have the pet name. Nobody cares what your pet's name is. But uh, they do care about your phone number. If you've got a cell phone number or two cell phone numbers, put them both on the, the embroidered collar and make sure your pet never is without that embroidered collar. Okay. If you want to put your boat name on there and a phone number, that also is not a bad choice. Obviously, your pet should be wearing a microchip, should have an Im a microchip implant, but uh, and this is necessary for legal purposes. Okay. This is necessary for on your, on your paperwork. This is what I always describe to people as your pet's vessel ID. Um, but it probably isn't going to get your pet back if it gets lost. Uh, you know, if it gets lost, uh, most people, especially you know, the further you get from home, the less likely it is that people are going to go scanning pets for microchips. Just, just you know, I, I don't have a great, a tremendous amount of faith in the microchip, even here. Uh, when, half the time when we get pets in, in the emergency hospital where I work and uh, stray pets are brought in, half the time the microchip is not usable. It's either not registered properly or it's not registered at all or the registration information is, is expired or whatever the case may be. Microchips are just not that useful for getting your pet back. They're extremely useful for proving that uh, in the event of a challenge to, to match the number that comes up on your pet's microchip with the paperwork that you have. Um, easily updatable identification is important in my book and you should take advantage of the computer age. I generally recommend what I use on my cat is a small USB flash drive. It's called a Pet, uh, uh, pet Protect ID. Uh, they, I think this one is off the market but I've mentioned some other ones here that are available that you could probably use. The nice thing about a USB flash drive type and the Flexi PC Pet ID that I'm going to show in the next picture is the large version that is suitable for big dogs, even medium-sized dogs. This thing it's in an aluminum capsule. It screws uh, together so that it's fairly well protected against the elements and against trauma. And yet, when you unscrew it inside, there is a USB drive that you just insert into a computer. And on that USB drive is all of the information that you have put there regarding your boat name, your contact information, your itinerary, uh, how they can contact people at home. You can put as much information. You can put your veterinarian's name and phone number. You can put any information on this tag that you choose to put on there, and you can change it at will by simply inserting it in your computer and changing the data. I think it's one of the most practical means, and uh, unfortunately, like any kind of electronic gizmo, these things are subject to damage and subject to not working and subject to getting, you know, getting bit in half or whatever the case may be, but in nine cases out of ten, they're going to work uh, excellent and may recover your dog for you when nothing else will. There are also some alternatives on the market now that involve a separate uh, a se a computer online registration, but they are generally free. Dinotag has it. Uh, these, this company makes everything from luggage tags to pet tags and everything in between. A Dynatag contains a QR or a quick read code. This is that code that you see on every every item that's on the market nowadays in the grocery store, in the hardware. You see it on, on posters on the side of the road. You see it on the sides of trucks that you aim your, your smartphone at, and it reads the information and sends you to a website. Red Dingo makes some very attractive pet tags that are QR tags. And this stuff's all available on Amazon. You can go to my website at www.captaindrdave.com 
I have a blog article on there called Pet Tags for the 21st Century. You might want to read that and uh, take a look and go to some of the links that are on there at Amazon where you can order these products. And here's some pictures. This is a picture of my cat, Mucho, and you, what he's wearing is the Pet Protect ID, the digital ID tag. Uh, like I said, that one seems to be unavailable right now. I, I have not been able to find it recently. You'll notice that he's wearing a yellow uh, collar, a bright yellow, it used to be a bright yellow collar. You can see the beginnings of his phone number on there. We have two phone numbers on that collar, one of my wife's cell phone and one of my cell phone. So in the first thing somebody's going to see when they go to pick him up is two phone numbers. Whether they even see the tag, they're certainly not going to miss the phone numbers that are there. In my opinion, the more visible the identification, the more likely somebody is to respond to it. The uh, Pet Protect ID tag contains all of his personal cat information, right on down to his recommendation that he never be fed any kind of dry food. He only eats canned food. That's all on this information. You could write a book and put it. I mean, there's not a lot of, by computer standards, not a lot of room on that pet tag, but by, uh, by book standards, we could probably put uh, a copy of War and Peace on that pet tag and still have room left over. So yeah, it's uh, plenty of information can be stored on that tag, but you do want to keep it simple and easy to access. The other alternatives here are the PC Pet ID that's up in the upper left hand corner. I put a quarter there so you can get an idea how big it is. It's a little big for really small dogs, but you can see that picture of the uh, terrier type dog, the Schnauzer or Wheaton Terrier, whatever that is that's sitting there. I think it's a terrier. Um, and you can get an impression as to how big that particular tag is. It tends to be reasonably heavy. Uh, it's fairly well made, although some of the are some of the comments online regarding this are that it does it is subject to some uh, uh, faults, okay? It can be damaged, it can come apart, uh, but for the most part, the ratings are pretty good on that particular tag, as opposed to the one that Mucho is wearing, the little plastic one where the data information is on the outside, it's actually on the external surface. Those are definitely not adequate for a pet who runs loose or spends any amount of time outdoors or is going to roughhouse with other pets. Mucho lives by himself, never goes outside other than on a leash, and he still is on his second one in a matter of probably three years since he's had this. Uh, they, they are made out of plastic and they have a tendency to break at the neck where the, where the uh, ring goes through. Down at the bottom you can see the QR tags. You see that familiar QR tag appearance on the Dynatag in the orange uh, that says recover. That's the Dynatag. Uh, the, the red dingo tag on the left is just one of many different varieties that they offer. It has the QR symbol on the other side, but they're very attractive and they work through a company called Pet Hub that um, you, it's the registration is free for simple basic registration they have all, offer a bunch of premium alternatives but to register it is free and upgrade up uh, updating your information all of that is up to you and again that's the, the the harder it is and the more effort it takes you to to update your information the less likely it is to get done which is one of the reasons that I prefer the USB type of tags but the USBs I think are falling by the way so and the other thing to keep in mind here is the leash is still your dog's best friend a leash will save your dog when nothing else will it will save your dog from poisons it'll save your dog from toads and snakes other unexpected things you know it can literally save your dog's life I get so many stories working in emer after hours emergency from people who who always say when their dog when a dog is brought in uh, in the throes of its agonal throes or is already dead who come in and say he never ever went in the road well, the fact of the matter is, is that, yes, they do go in the road. They go in the road at the least, when you least think they will. So don't get the impression that that can't happen to you. Um, a leash is still your dog's best friend. We had uh, some friends who were on a boat down in Puerto Rico who were walking their dog in town, and they had him on a leash. And But it was one of those long leashes, and when they reeled him in. They were standing talking to somebody on the street and when they reeled him in he had an empty box of 
rat poison in his mouth. They were lucky to see that he actually had it in his mouth. They came to me, rather than going to the veterinarian, they came to me and said, what do we do? And my immediate response was take him to the veterinarian and make sure that he's treated adequately with antidote and that they induce vomiting. Uh, do it quickly, do it now, don't wait. And they were very successful in saving that dog's life. Otherwise, that dog may very well have died. But a leash, a uh, six, proper six-foot leash, probably would have avoided that situation entirely. We're going to talk further here about entrance requirements. Now it varies by the country or the island, and these things change by the day, so it's hard to give you current updated information, but uh, I'm going to be as accurate as I can and give you as much information here as I'm able to. If you go to my website, www captaindrdave.com uh, you will find a, an entire page that is devoted to the Bahamas and uh, import regulations on that page you will find a free absolutely free application for uh, for admission of your pet an application for an import permit into the Bahamas some some websites will charge you money for this particular form so you can you can always get it for free online you can get it for free by writing to the Bahamas uh, Department of Agriculture or you can go to my website and get it for free so keep in mind that um, that CaptainDrDave.com does have a page devoted to Bahamas in, uh, pet information so before you leave you should do the veterinary thing and that and you need to do it at least a month before you leave get your pet a physical exam okay go to the veterinarian and say what do I need to do and follow his directions yes there's more here than really needs to be done if you're not going to take your pet ashore in any of these places uh, if you're going to skip to the Bahamas skip the Bahamas and go on down to the Caribbean and not take your pet ashore anywhere you can get by with a lot less but you're taking your pet because you care about your pet so you want to do what's best for your pet and what you really need is a physical exam a stool sample and a heartworm test you need a distemper combination vaccination whether it's a cat or dog you need a cat distemper in your uh, in your cat and a, or a dog distemper combination in your dog you need a new rabies vaccination do not get a three do not assume that your three-year vaccination is going to be good everywhere yeah it's good in the Bahamas if that's all the only place you're going and you had a, a rabies vaccination done a year ago your three-year one will be good but if you plan on going anywhere beyond that or plan on staying any longer get a fresh brand new three-year rabies get a fresh brand new rabies vaccination and make sure you have their rabies certificate because if you don't have any of these things if you don't have the paperwork as far as they're concerned you didn't get it done and then get a health certificate stating that all of this was done preferably a government health certificate although again for the Bahamas you can get by with just your veterinarian's health computer generated health certificate but ideally you want a USDA government health certificate some optional things that you can get done okay and for the Bahamas you really should get all of this done uh, Lyme and lepto vaccinations in your dog okay get the heartworm combination test when they do the heartworm test it's very little extra to get the combination test which also tests for the tick-borne diseases Lyme disease, ehrlichiosis, and anaplasmosis. All right, so get the heartworm test combination. For your cat, get the leukemia vaccination. Okay, that's required also in the Bahamas. And in, before you get that, you're going to, if your cat has not already had it done, get the leukemia FIV test done so that we know that your cat is negative and doesn't have any of these issues. Your pet should have a microplant in, uh, microchip implant again your microchip on your pet is the equivalent of your vessel ID on your boat okay outside the US you should have an ISO chip if you need to have a second chip get it but most of the time the chips that we have now are going to be sufficient for import purposes in most countries uh, again all we need to do is be able to scan that chip and be able to confirm that the numbers on the paperwork match the number of the chip uh, you're going to need to get an antibody, uh, antibody titer test, a rabies antibody titer test. Generally going to run you about 80 bucks or so, somewhere around 100 bucks figure. Um, 
this is a test that determines whether your pet's rabies vaccination actually works. And it is required by the Bahamas. It is required by uh, the it, it is required by the government of Antigua Barbuda. All right, it is something that you need to have done to make sure that your pet's going to be able to get into these places. And I take that back. You do not legally need to have this done for the Bahamas if that's all you're going to do is the Bahamas. If you're going to go anywhere beyond the Bahamas, then and you want to take your pet ashore, it will allow you to get into the most countries and the most places that you visit. Uh, there isn't anything significantly more that you can do other than the rabies antibody titer test. This test has to be sent out to Kansas State University. That's the only place in the United States that it is done. Uh, if you take it to your veterinarian and they send their blood work out to some uh, professor, some uh, specialty laboratory, that laboratory is going to take the blood and repackage it and send it off to Kansas State for the rabies antibody test. So this may this will make your blood work take longer this will take make your results longer coming back it may take upwards of a month or more for you to get your results back this is why you need to give yourself adequate time and above all again you need to have the certificate that it was all done and then you're going to want your USDA international health certificate you know like i said a your veterinarian's computer generated health certificate may be adequate for places like if you're just going to the Bahamas and for a lot of islands, but there are places where your international health certificate is the only health certificate they're going to accept. So make sure you get that. It needs to be endorsed by the federal veterinarian, which means it has to be sent to your state capital where the federal veterinarian resides, it has to be signed off on by him, and then sent back. And again, this is another issue that can make your this particular um, preparation take longer than you might expect so give yourself a good month when you're doing all this before you're going to leave so that you can have it all done on the other hand don't take it don't do it too far in advance or you may end up with uh, having to repeat it all sooner than you think this is a picture of the USDA uh, health certificate the the federal government's US federal government health certificate the white sheet there with all the lines. It's about an eight-part um, uh, carbonless uh, set that requires, that generally has to be filled out by hand. Veterinarians a lot of times just don't want to do it because it's a lot of time, effort, and somebody's going to get writer's cramp by the time it's all finished. So they have a tendency to want to just do a computer-generated health certificate, which looks a lot like the vaccination certificate there in the pink. Um, just keep in mind that uh, that USDA certificate, in spite of the fact that they can't do it uh, with their computer, they can still fill it out by hand, and it should be, uh, and that's what you want. We have a microchip certificate here that just shows um, who who your pet is and shows their microchip number. And on the right there, you will see the rabies antibody titer. titer test results. That form's a little more sophisticated looking now, but that comes from Kansas State University. Carry plenty of copies of this stuff. Don't be afraid to make, uh, to make uh, Xerox copies, photocopies of all, all of the paperwork, and carry three or four copies of each one. That way, when you present your paperwork to each country, to get into each country, you hand them copies rather than the original, and most of the time that will be fine. Don't let them keep them. Get them back, and that way you'll have them because eventually they're going to they're going to disappear here and there, and you don't want to get caught without them. So carry plenty of extra copies. And again, three or four is probably plenty. Uh, and you're going to need one if you stay out there long enough. You're going to need to get all of these things done probably once a year. Now the rabies antibody titer test, if you keep up with your rabies vaccinations should not be need to be repeated uh, on an annual basis but you may uh, don't be surprised if you run into some place where they they're going to say it's been too long since you had it done you're going to need to get it done again uh, the requirements are going to change somewhat as you get further and further away from home so don't be you know be prepared for surprises now you can generally still get in 
whether you've had uh, whether your pet can get in or not is is a, a different issue. Generally, if your pet doesn't pass, doesn't make the grade on these um, on these requirements, you can still go ashore. You just can't take your pet. All right. Um, generally, the worst thing that's going to happen is that your pet won't be able to go ashore. But in uh, the UK and in any former British colonies, there's a lot of places throughout the world where uh, the there's going to be issues with taking your pet ashore. But down in the islands, uh, St. Kitts, Nevis, Dominica, uh, St. Lucia, you can see the, the different islands here where there are issues, although I have heard stories from people of being able to uh, call a local veterinarian out to your boat to visit your pet, examine your pet, pay the fee, and voila, suddenly your pet is allowed ashore uh, without any issues. But some countries still do have quarantine requirements, some of them to the point where they require that you send the pet to England for quarantine. And my general attitude is keep your pet aboard, avoid that situation. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, BVI, Antigua, Barbuda, Grenada, Bahamas, Bermuda, you should be okay with these particular requirements. Uh, you, a lot of these places you will have to apply for an animal import permit such as you do in the Bahamas. The cost will vary. It's $10 per pet in the Bahamas. So one of these islands, I recall, it was $50 that I read. Um, but uh, generally that is strictly a, a fee uh, it's a revenue generating device basically and uh, you know most of the time it's simply a formality. The BVI supposedly does, the British Virgins do like advanced contact with their chief agricultural officer uh, but most people don't do that frankly and I've never heard of anybody having any issues regarding that. And remember that a rule is not necessarily a rule. The smaller the country the more power is generally given to the individual customs people and the people that you have to see before you take your pet in. Um, the, uh, the official regulations that, they, that you read about for a given country are often applicable to people who are flying in or coming in commercially or who are immigrating to the country. Pets on cruising boats very often have an entirely different set of rules, so you don't never know you don't ever know exactly what you're going to encounter. And again, it depends a lot on the particular official that you have to that you happen to encounter. Um, the uh, the official that you run into may have a, uh, a separate set of rules, so and and it may depend on what official is on on any given day. So if you're not happy with the regulations that you run into, this is the bottom line. Uh, don't be making a, 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 a problem of yourself. You know, don't protest and don't complain. Uh, you're just going to bring attention to yourself. It may be much more effectively to leave quietly and go check out what the alternatives are. Call a local veterinarian. See what they, you know, leave your pet on your boat. Go see a local veterinarian. See what they say. Um, come back and try to try to enter again on another day when a different uh, official is working. There are uh, alternatives. Um, the larger the country for the most part, the less likely you're going to run into that kind of variation and the greater the stickler they're going to be. Uh, the United States tends to, of course, be one of the easiest countries to get pets into. Um, most of these places that you see here are pretty easy to get into. Central America, uh, South America, Mexico, uh, Europe and, and most of Asia, it's harder to go in through England than it is some of the other EU countries. Um, and the US and Canada are supposed to be some of the easiest of all. Now, there are exceptions and you really should be aware that certain dog breeds are not welcome and if you have one of those dog breeds you probably already know that. If you have a Rottweiler or a pit bull you probably are aware that uh, they are not always welcome everywhere you go and countries are very similar. They uh, they make their own rules. They they determine who's welcome and who's not. Even Canada, the, uh, the province of Ontario has some issues with some of these breeds of dogs. So you want to be aware that uh, if you have, choose to have one of these kinds of dogs with you, you may not be able to take it ashore. Um, any, any breed that might be perceived as threatening or dangerous, and again, the local official may be able to make that call on his or her own. 
uh, and where you have been previously before you get to a country may also have, play a role in what kind of regulations you encounter. If you have visited a third world country, uh, an undeveloped nation, before you uh, visit a, if, before you go to a country with more stringent requirements, they're probably going to be much harder on you than if you jump from Hawaii, where they have very, very stringent regulations, into a country that has very stringent regulations. They're going to generally be much easier on you as far as the quarantine requirements. So the bottom line on that one is keep a good log, okay, so that you can prove where you've been and uh, can show to the officials that there have been no suspicious stops in between the, uh, the last stop and their stop. So there's some websites here that you can check out. Uh, my, my website has uh, information uh, regarding a lot of these things. PetTravel.com is worth visiting. And PetsOnTheGo.com are these are a couple of websites that are that uh, cover a lot of information on traveling with your pets. So the bottom line when you get to a to a, through everything here is don't hassle anybody, don't start any fights, don't don't get into any issues with the officials, and don't cheat. Don't be like some people. There, you know, I ran into a pre some people when we were in the Bahamas that went all the way from the Bahamas. They were bragging in the Bahamas how they had traveled all the way down to South America and back and never checked in at any country, never checked in or out of any island that they visited. All right, those are not the regulations. And yes, they got away with it. But people who do that sort of thing, if they do get caught, certainly give all the cruisers out there a bad name. And the same thing happens with pets. I've run into people who've taken their pet ashore in every island along the way and never bothered to clear it in anywhere. So, you know, a lot of people do it and the officials, I'm certainly know they do it, but keep in mind that you are a guest. Getting caught could be, have a negative effect on all cruisers. Uh, you know, just move on to the next piece of paradise and enjoy your trip. And that's the end of this section and I thank you for your time. Uh, we will cover a number of other issues in section two and again